This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. My guest on the podcast today is joining me from Fredericksburg, Texas, the head brewer for Altstadt Brewery in Fredericksburg, uh, Craig Rowan. Welcome to the podcast, Craig. Thank you, Jamie. I'm very happy to be with you today. We are going to keep the lager mini theme going. We've had uh, this fantastic kind of Texas lager focus for a number of the last few episodes. And, uh, you know, and it's been really fun. I've heard a lot of great feedback from uh, folks listening uh, that they've enjoyed our ability to kind of focus on this because, I mean, let's face it, lagers tend to be the favorite beers that most brewers love to make. Um, you know, and we have enjoyed delving into the the finer points of the ways that folks make it. Altshot Brewery, if you're not familiar with it, is is, um, I mean, it's a unique thing funded by heirs to a, a former media fortune and the, the Scripps family. And they wanted a brewery in a place, uh, you know, to make beer, the kind of they wanted to drink, um, and put an amazing amount of resources to build a beautiful German style, uh, brewery, beer hall, beer experience, restaurant, etc., and plop it down in the middle of uh, wine country in Texas. Um, it's just a model for brewery creation that we don't see very often where someone just has this passion and they um, spare no expense at building it. Um, while we're recording this podcast remotely, uh, I did actually visit the brewery while we were down there and we did get to you know tour and see the brewery and we actually filmed a, a video class with Craig that'll be out there for all access video subscribers um, later this year. And so you will get to see more of the brewery itself at that point. Um, but we're going to talk about that kind of process, how the brewery was built built, um, you know, how it was envisioned, uh, you know, you didn't start as head brewer, but you moved into this position and your own background is actually, uh, you know, an interesting one, which, uh, is a nice contrast in the way that you have worked up through the industry to get to where you are. Um, can't wait to talk about that with you, Craig, um, uh, before we do that, as the brewery industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, g and Chillers has set the standard on quality, service, reliability, and dedication to their customers' craft. New this year, redundancy meets efficiency. g and micro-channel condensers are built with all aluminum construction, which eliminates galvanic corrosion. Using half the refrigerant of conventional condensers with fewer braced connections translates to a lower GWP and less opportunity for leaks. Call g and Chillers today to discuss your project or reach out directly at gdchillers.com. Also, this uh, episode is brought to you by BSG Hops Solutions Sativa. Meet the latest in the BSG Hop Solutions portfolio, Sativa. Strong expressions of stone fruit, floral, and resinous pine flavors and aromas define this blend, crafted specifically for use in hazy IPAs and other hop-forward beers. Sativa is ideal for aroma, whirlpool, and dry hop additions to hazy and juicy IPAs or for any other hoppy styles where a combination of citrus, tropical fruit, and pine aromatics are desired. Go to bsgcraftbrewing.com to learn more or call 1-800-374-2739. Also, uh, you know, if those of you listening are a brewery and planning or considering uh, following that road, uh, go to breweryworkshop.com. Check out our upcoming brewery workshop that we are uh, putting on in June in, in Denver, Colorado. It's actually almost sold out and there's a, a few spots left. But uh, if you are planning on doing this, we are excited that everybody is getting vaccinated and that we are starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel of this and are confident that we can safely put on an event in June with uh, a limited, uh, I think, you know, 40 or so um, breweries in planning so check that out and uh yeah craig let's uh let's pivot let's talk about your background in brewing and then uh, also um, move from there to talking about the how altstadt uh, came to be so uh, my career in brewing started when i was in my early 20s had a job i hated so much that i quit without fallback uh and then the advice of a friend i just applied a for a warehouse job at the Abita Brewing Company in Abita Springs, Louisiana, uh, one of the oldest craft breweries in the country, uh, actually. Um, and so I worked warehouse job. They paid me uh, an okay hourly wage and gave me benefits. So I figured I'd do that until 
I found something that, you know, I could do for the rest of my life. Uh, and, you know, I kind of fell in love with it, uh, with craft beer in general. Um, well, starting with the Beatas beers and then, you know, gradually trying other breweries beers. Um, then I got moved up from the packaging line to the labeler on the bottle line. Um, I liked getting an extra dollar an hour for doing that. Uh, <laughs> you know, the job kind of sucks, but it was fun. And then, you know, I s saw like what the brewers are doing, started talking to them. Um, started thinking, man, this job kind of sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, so I talked to the brewmaster. Uh, his name is Mark Wilson. He's still there today uh, about an opening because uh, a brewer was leaving. And, you know, we had never said two sentences to each other. But, you know, I showed up to work on time every day, never called in sick unless I was actually sick. And uh, apparently people noticed that. And he's like, uh, yeah, I'd love to put you in. You seem like a bright dude um, and dependable. And that's really all they were looking for back then. There weren't a lot of, this was in sure. 2000, this was in 2011 when I got promoted to the cellar. Um, so there weren't a lot of people coming out of school. It was a really hard job to find people for. It's not like today where you have people knocking down your door to, to, to brew your beer. Um, so he started me in the cellar and then I learned on the job um, uh, how to cellar, carbonate beer, uh, lager it, store it, age it, um, you know, all that stuff. And then I moved into the brew house and the very first time I ever brewed beer was on a 100 barrel uh, Merlin <laughs> kettle. So I had never touched a homebrew system before uh, I brewed on a professional system. So I am uh, just the complete opposite of most people in this industry. I started large scale and then gradually had to learn down. So, and I did, um, Abita moved on to a 200 barrel system. It's funny. That's such an American, or that's a yeah. European way of actually, of, of moving through it versus yeah. the American way, you know, Americans tend to come out through that world of home brewing. That's right. Um, yeah. you know, but in Europe, you know, with the home brewing is just not as you know prevalent a thing. And so if you are interested in going into brewing, you go to university and you learn how to brew on, you know, large scale systems and it kind of well, come. Yeah. In Europe, it's a, you know, a decorated career. Um, in America, it's a hobby that, you know, was sort of like mixed in with, you know, creating moonshine in your backyard. It was kind of looked at like that way, but, sure. um, it's certainly not, it's, it, it's technical and rewarding and hard and frustrating, but, uh, it, it's fantastic. Um, but by the time, uh, my end of Abita, I actually was doing the pilot brews for the tap room. And that was being done on a 10 gallon Sapco system. So I had to actually <laughs> scale down. And I will tell you, I learned more about brewing uh, on that little thing uh, than I, I, I got a better understanding. Like as you're so hands on like that, and you actually see what's going on. Um, and you know, you're putting recipe to paper and then recipe to, to malt, uh, I'm sorry. And then recipe to action in this little system. And it gives you so much pride and, it's, it's just really cool. It, it really makes it, you know, a passion and an art and a craft. Um, but by that point, I sort of hit my limit there and I was ready to, you know, expand, venture out. I didn't have any kids yet. So right. um, my wife was fine with me trying to find another job. And um, I knew uh, the person hiring from Allstock from Abita and basically he said they'd take me on uh, to do all the cellaring and write all the recipes for the tap room. And basically, and it, it wasn't even for that much more money. I just wanted like to have, you know, that freedom was sure. just a, uh, super attractive. Um, the only risk being, you know, in the craft beer world, you know, it's a, it's a risk to move across the country for a startup because it's so competitive and, you know, you gotta, you gotta trust ownership. You got to right. trust the business plan and to touch on what you said earlier. So with Altstadt, uh, it's a father and son from the Scripps family. Uh, and they are, they are based in Fredericksburg. This is where they grew up on uh, Fredericksburg is deep, deep German roots. Um, and yeah, they loved German beer, uh, especially the son, Will, uh, he fell in love with it going to Germany 
And the basic question was, well, why can't we get this beer here? Um, you know, shipping it across the Atlantic is just never going to give you the product that you would get in Germany or any other European uh, beer. Um, so, you know, like, well, we'll just build our own German beer brewery uh, right in Texas. We have the means to do it, and we're going to do it. Uh, and when you say the spirit, no expense, no, they didn't because they were very passionate about it. Um, and they're not and, messing around. And, and when we say spare no expense, I mean, I, I feel the need to just help people visualize this. Imagine the most immaculately put together brewery at, at a, and you're brewing around under 20,000 barrels. Like, you know, imagine the most immaculately mm -hmm. built brewery under 20,000 barrels that you've ever seen. And then just multiply that by a few times. And, and <laughs> you, you, you really have to do that to get to, to you know, Altstadt. When, you, you know, in talking to other brewers in Texas, you know, mostly go, well, have you been there? Like, well, we've driven by it and we've seen it and it's <laughs> – at rather amazing you know you you pull up and of course there's gates out front and you know you look and it's this humongous building built in this kind of you know german european chateau kind of uh, you know style and the i mean i've literally never seen anything at that scale like it before um it's a you have to build something like that. You have to very consciously want to execute a, you know, a very precise vision and have an incredible means of course, to do that. Um, there were so many ways to kind of cut corners. In fact, we'll have to put up a, a picture of the brewery and whatnot along, uh, along with this on the, on our website, just so people can help, you know, understand and see more of it because it truly is just a phenomenally beautiful thing um and, and just absolutely uh kind of amazing with the amount of detail down to glass mosaics in the in the floors um down to you know woodwork on spiral stairs uh, you know every, the brew house itself from the copper vessels to the you know more modern vessels the packaging line that you all have built out the fermentation so i mean it is i mean it's an incredibly beautiful brewery for the kind of scale of production that you all are doing. Yeah. Um, and it, it goes deeper than that. So the, the, the expense wasn't even spared in, in our QA department too. I mean, you know, the best microscopes, uh, you know, yeast counters, like things like that, anything, uh, mass spectrometer, like we basically want to make sure the beer is the vision that ownership wanted. Um, it's, like we really have all the tools at our disposal. Um, now you can have all those tools and all those fun things, but if you don't know how to use them or you don't have a passion, basically if you treat them as taking the easy way out, it's going to come through in the beer and your beer is going to suck. Uh, sure. So just, just cause you own a Porsche doesn't make you a good driver. That's correct. <laughs> it's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually spot on. So, I mean, yeah, it, 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 it certainly can make our lives easier, but, you know, um, with more of the cool stuff comes, you know, more problems, uh, more challenges. Um, but it's fun. Yeah, we're very blessed. But we so yeah. So talk to me then about this process. You you came in on the seller side. Obviously, now you're leading mm -hmm. the brewing operations. Um, you know, how did that uh, that move occur? And talk to me about some of uh, you know the ways that you've uh, you were able to um, uh, help kind of imprint and add your uh, uh voice or not even voice because that may not be the right word for it but um you know help uh you know move the brewery to the point where it was better realizing the vision of the creators sure. um so when i was hired on and you know talked to ownership a little bit i sort of need to gauge what their vision for their beer was i mean because Basically, I, I just want to get within the style guidelines, uh, whether it be from the Brewers Association or BJCP or um, what uh, Germany dictates the style guidelines should be. Um, you know, I can always find an amalgam of that, but there's even within that window, there's so much uh like a Kolsch from one brewery could be totally proper and a Kolsch from another brewery can be totally proper and they can be totally different. Uh, while being similar so you know talking and you're bit, in a competitive market where there are some great lager makers now who are doing it really well and winning lots of medals for it also texas is amazing especially in that space it's 
it, it's really, really cool to be in this area. And one of the reasons I love it so much is that competition. Like we got to keep besting each other, you know, and, but it, it's tough. And I appreciate that competition because the beers here are amazing. But um, basically where we go is um, we want it to be approachable. So lower on the hop, uh, the IBU count, uh, and a little lower on the ABV count, like a little more towards the sessionable side. Um, so with that in mind, all the recipes that I wrote for Tap Room were on that um, uh, on that wavelength of just approachable, uh, but while still being totally within style. Uh, the flagships we had out at the time uh, are uh, Amber, which is an all beer lager, um, and Kolsch were uh, we're out there, uh, still a little too much in the test recipe range from, from my liking. Um, so those I actually, when I got promoted in, uh, 2018, because our previous brewmaster, uh, left for another job, um, I was able to, um, actually up the IBUs a little bit, beca <laughs> uh, because they were, the beers were a little too sweet, uh, a little, a little out of balance, a little out of spec in my opinion. Um, so brought that up a little bit, uh, got the ABVs more in line, you know, changed a lot of technical stuff like uh, gris ratio, uh, temperatures in the malt. Uh, and then we actually started using yeast from inside the country because we were bringing yeast in from Germany, which is awesome. And uh, but when it gets tangled up in customs, it's just a nightmare and you wind up with a bunch of dead slants and things like that. Um, so I wanted you know, quality, consistency, uh, and for the beer to be uh, proper, um, which I felt it was just a little out, just a, a little bit outside of that skew. So we changed a couple of things for that, cleaned it up, and the results have been awesome. Just fantastic. And, and then in 2019, um, you know, the, you got to experience the the fruits of your labor with uh, two GABF gold medals in uh, Hellas and in Kolsch that year. Yeah. Um, kind of, uh, you know, a big shot across the bow with, uh, you know, just say that you guys are, are here and uh, making great German style beers. And, well, uh, and, you know. yeah, and, and basically to say, you know, we're not just some rich kids play thing. Like we're serious here. Like we, we are, we are here to make excellent beer and we have a lot of german speakers in fredericksburg so we have to right. impress them and when they're impressed that means more than the medals although the medals were pretty pretty great sure well it's fun that a kid that started out in the warehouse and then went into the labeling um, you know machine and then start, got into a brew house and worked their way up is uh you know can lead the brew house side of, of this kind and of I, and i will say this there were a lot of a lot of times along the way uh where someone told me i was in the wrong field um, I was told I would not be successful in this career, uh, several times. Um, so, uh, if you love it and you know, it's something you want to do, just, you know, keep working at it because it's, and you know, other people say stuff just cause sure, it's with sure. them. So it, it, it's been, it's been just awesome. Well, I want to dive, you know, I, I, we've kind of glossed over some of those changes and some of the, you know, the kind of more technical things to tell an overall story. And I want to dive into some of the more details. Uh, but before we do, the most common complaint about hard seltzers that they need more flavor. Extract alone is a weak flavoring agent and can leave a chemical aftertaste, but there is a better way. Craft concentrate blends from Old Orchard are packed with real fruit first, no added sugars, and just enough natural flavor. Breweries are turning to Old Orchard concentrates for seltzer with more body, color, and aroma. Turn seltzer skeptics into supporters with seltzer that drinks like a beer. Get started at www.oldorchard.com slash brewer also for years brewery db has been the industry's only professionally curated source of brewery and beer information in 2019 over 1 million brewery visits were made by craft fans searching for breweries on brewerydb.com in just a few weeks brewery db will unveil an all-new experience to help craft lovers get back on the brewery trail to take full advantage of the enhanced marketing power of brewery db and increase your taproom traffic, set up your account on marketmybrewery.com. That's marketmybrewery.com. It's easy and it's free. So we can talk, let's uh, talk about some of the the core styles that you make. You know, you make a Kolsch, an Alt, a uh, uh, Helles, a uh, Leicht beer, a uh, Hefeweizen, a German IPA, of course, Pilsner, um, you know, um, 
let's kind of start uh, talking about where some of the core recipes came from uh, and then how you started tackling some of those finer points, um, you know, in the brew house itself and in that kind of recipe formulation to, to bring them into, you know, this kind of focus that you thought would better represent this idea of, um, you know, beer, German inspired beer, that drinkers in Texas were going to flock to, and that would be equally respected by, uh, peers making similar styles. Uh, well, sure. Um, you know, with the, the original two were the Kolsch and the Lager. Lager is a uh, Munichella style. Um, we had, well, by the time I came in, we had basically starter recipes, you know, base recipes to kind of edit a little bit. Um, and, you know, they hit a, a lot of the right parameters, but there were just some little things lacking. You know, uh, head retention uh, was one of them. Um, Sometimes the yeast flavors was inconsistent. That was another one. Uh, body was, you know, a little thin. Uh, so uh, things like that. And then, you know, little inconsistencies with how it would finish attenuation, things like that. Um, a lot of that was, that was obviously from the yeast as well. And then, you know, uh, very low traces of DMS were in there too. So um, that had to be cleaned up and, you know, that's kind of where you sort of have to understand your brew house a little bit, how it's going to behave. Um, like the DMS was really easy to clean up, you know, just adjust the boil properly and we were fine. Um, with head retention, that's really where you got to get into your mash. Head retention is just kind of a lot of theory, um, but there's some, there's some science behind it. But, you know, step mashes, even with well-modified malt, you know, if you mash in at a proper uh, quote-unquote protein rest, uh, you could really make a lot of those proteins that uh, help the body a little bit and give you uh, some good head retention down the line. But you can also overdo it um, by by doing it too long. But and that's anywhere between you know 122, 132 degrees uh, for a mash in temperature. Um, Was this something that uh, you know that you adjusted in you know, temperature time based on the way things were operating in your system that might have worked a little differently than? um you know other kinds of sellers and i'm curious 100%. how you know i mean this is the weird thing we get into in brewing you can say well you got to mash at this temperature for this long um but there are also differing uh, effects as they you know every brew house is actually a little bit different and so uh you know for you how did you go about solving uh, you know or thinking about and playing with some of the parameters you know in that problem solving process well first of all you gotta look at what's happening so in the mash tun for instance you know there's an agitator there uh now uh, home brewers have a mash paddle so you know you're told not to stir too aggressively right because you don't want to pick up aeration cause a lot of issues down the line. Um, and then you don't want to, you know, a process called shearing could actually, you know, damage the husks, um, which affects your louder down the line. Aeration is the other big part of it. Uh, just one thing I noticed was our uh, mash ton was just stirring the mash too aggressively. Um, that causes a lot of issues down the line. Um, and it's kind of hard to pinpoint, but when you start to fix little things like that, you sort of start to see the overall product get better. Um, and it's really intricate. And when you're doing a, uh, lagers and, um, you know, lager type ales like Kolsch, you can't hide any of that stuff. Um, so anything that's off, even if you can't pinpoint it, um, you know, you really got to go through your entire brew house and see that you're doing everything, you know, as optimally or as the best you can. Um, but you're hundred percent right. Uh, different equipment will do different things. That's kind of why you have to sort of find what works for you. So what does that process look like of brewing it one way, logging that, being able to track the kinds of changes that you made and then, you know, moving back into the kind of, you know, sensory process at the end to ev evaluate the way that, uh, um, you know, any of those changes reflected themselves in finished beers. Vigorous, vigorous note taking. Yeah. Um, so now it's obviously very important that you have individual brew sheets for every brew that you do. Um, and then eventually you can, uh, let your brew sheets evolve into how you want the brew house to run. So basically you can notate, like just for example, uh, notate lowered the, um, 
amperage on the agitator uh, to you know make it less aggressive. Uh, you can notate that on the sheet, but then as you go, you know the recipes wind up getting set, and then that's not even a thought for a new brewer coming in. Um, it's a, a lot of this needs to be done, you know, on the test brews, and then when we did. When I was doing, uh, you know, some of the, the pilot brews for the tap room, uh, I was super, super uh, focused on every single step and what it was going through. Basically, you just want that beer treated as delicately as possible, and you need to make sure the temperatures are right. Uh, so if the temperatures are correct, um, your water to grist ratio is, is good. Um, your beer is being treated delicately and you're not aerating anywhere, you're going to be okay. Uh, and then the beer is going to taste good and then you can sort of fine tune it from there. But you have to get everything right. Oh, I am, you know, cleanliness. Sure, yeah. sure. You know, is it a, you know, so it does sound like you were testing some concepts and principles on smaller taproom batches to see how those might have, uh, you know, impacted things on your system. Did you bring some of that learning back to some of the core brews or were you making very minute uh, kind of changes to some of those core beers that would probably be less visible to end consumers, you know, and then reviewing those, you know, as you went? So what was cool about, so the taproom beers are all done on the same system, right? Um, uh, the system's 30 hectoliters. So a, a smaller brew would just be 20 hectoliters, but most of the taproom beers are 30. Um, and you know, when you've been doing it long enough, you know, how you want your beer to taste when you're writing it down on paper. So when I write the recipe, the Schwartz was the first one I did. When I wrote the recipe for Schwartz, I knew exactly what I wanted. Um, and if something was a little bit different in the end product, I think in with Schwartz case, I think the color was maybe just a little bit lighter than I wanted just a little bit. Um, you can sort of go back and adjust, but that comes from knowing exactly what you want. Uh, and then trying to figure out why you didn't get what you want. So that, uh, that actually takes a lot of experience um, uh, to be able to know that. But uh, if you, know, you have a good palette and you have good commercial examples that you want uh, to try and achieve, uh, you can do it uh, basically just brew and then see what you get at the end and then try to understand why you didn't get the roastiness you thought you were gonna get uh, or the color or the body uh, things like that. And then, you know, just read up from, you know, the plethora of good reading materials on how to get certain things. I mean, it's one of those things where the, the more you learn in this industry, the, the more you realize you don't know. And um, it, it's just never ending cascade of information out there. But the more you get into it, the more you figure out what you're missing or what you can do. And then that just creates a whole new set of problems that you want to try to fix. Um, sure. Sure. But, no, I love that. You know, there's so many different channels of creativity here, you know, and there are folks, you know, who start and then iterate and work to a finished piece. And there are people that envision what it's, what the end is going to look like. And, you know, work back to, you know, to, to write a recipe and think about all of those process pieces in a way that can achieve that, that end goal. Um, you know, they're, they're all valid creative methods, you know, but it's interesting. And I, and I love talking to, to brewers who operate this way, you know, in the way that, you know, um, you know, a baker may work or, a, you know, a pastry chef where they're combining this kind of, you know, artistry and expression with, you know, highly technical process as well. Um, but being able to envision what each of those small choices is going to make, you know, using, um, you know, this wide palette of ingredients and all of the very technical pieces, the way that that your brew house is set up, you know, certainly there's, there's so many variables at play there that mm -hmm. trying to kind of conceive of how all of those things are going to do something, uh, you know, how all of those various pieces are orchestrated into a, you know, finished hold, you know, is, is a huge challenge. Um, you know, how long, for example, did it take you to really understand the impacts of the Altstadt brew house and how it might've been different than uh, past uh, larger brew house that you had worked on before? Uh, honestly, it really wasn't long because, uh, you know, I attribute that to when I was coming up at Abita, I started on a, a hundred barrel system, but it had, its kettle was a Merlin kettle. 
So a Merlin kettle, basically most, uh, most brews for uh, breweries are 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, I mean, ales really only need 60, uh, but that's gotta be enough time to get all the volatiles out. Uh, a Merlin kettle uses a, a process called stripping. And basically a Merlin kettle is a cone that's just heat, super heated up and it's so hot and this like layer, inch layer of work is showered over it. And the stripping basically instantly gets all the volatiles out. So you can boil for 30 minutes um, instead of 60 or 90. So it's an energy saver, uh, time saver. And the only reason, uh, I mean, harping on that is, you know, that's a pretty unique system. Uh, and then when uh, they got their new 200 barrel system, it was just a, a standard kettle. They found energy saving in other ways, which is pretty cool. Um, so you kind of saw how that was worked differently. And that actually had a wet mill. So I saw how a wet mill worked as compared to a dry mill. Um, so you understand the different efficiencies. You understand, like, there is an overall efficiency that home brewers look at in their system, but there's a lot of different efficiencies when you get into it that you want to look at, um, aside from just the malt efficiency and your yield that your brew house can give you. Um, and then I, when I was doing the pilot brews on the 10 gallon Sabco system, and this was an old Sabco system, like it was like Han Solo trying to get the Millennium Falcon to run to get a good product out of it. And basically the goal was to get a consistent product from that first system to the second system and then have a similar product on that smaller system. So, you know, you, I kind of inherently learned how to judge di different things that a, a, brew, a brew house could do just from this because I had to. Um, so, you know, the more uh, experience you have on different brew houses, the better prepared you are to come into a different brewery um, and sort of see what its quirks and kinks were, or are, excuse me, and, um, you know, just learn to uh, adjust to it. Um, but, you know, the brewer's got to do the adjusting for the most part, because uh, the system, especially one of these large things, it, it, it's not going to do much adjusting. Sure, sure. Let's uh, let's talk about ingredients, because, you know, certainly uh, at Altschtai, you're using a, a, a somewhat different palette of ingredients than uh, you might have been using at past brewing gigs. Um, before we do that, ABS Commercial is excited to be a part of today's podcast. ABS is a full brewery outfitter offering brew houses, tanks, keg washers, and small parts. As a part of ABS Commercial's ongoing give back campaign, they'll be giving away an ABS Keg Viking keg washer in June. So make sure to periodically check the ABS commercial Facebook page to find out when the contest opens up and how you can enter to win a keg Viking. Um, you know, so you, uh, you obviously for Altstadt with that goal of being, you know, executing, um, you know, two style and traditional uh, German style ales and lagers, um, ingredients become a huge, uh, you know, piece of that. How, um, how did the brewery initially, you know, make decisions around that and how have you, um, continued or, or tweaked some of those, uh, ingredient decisions? Uh, well, so this is very easy. Uh, everything has to come from Germany. Uh, so the malt is all German. Uh, this is much to the dismay of American malt salesmen. Um, but some of their products are fun to use in, the, in, in one offs. Uh, but yeah, I, it, it's all got to come from Germany. And then same with the hops. So, and that means no, like, I, you know, I can't use um, an American version of a German hop. It's got to come from German soil. Um, and then uh, yeast, I'm uh, You are okay. even more Reinheitsgebot than uh, Reinheitsgebot there. Uh. <laughs> a, a little bit, yeah. Um, well, now again, with the Reinheitsgebot, I, I, we say we're guided by the Reinheitsgebot. We aren't strict adherers to it. Uh, we can explain that in a, in a little bit. But um, yeah, the yeast, uh, we, will, we do uh, get from Y yeast, and that's just fine by me because the strains were all, you know, born in Germany, so basically we view them as housing them uh for us so um that all comes stateside um but yeah uh those those are three of the four main ingredients the other one is the water which basically we treat to match the water profile that you know a beer from cologne or dusseldorf or munich etc would come from but that's it those four ingredients and they all come from germany and so you set up water, <laughs> which you, uh, you know, mimic in, in mineral content to, you know, based on the style that you're actually brewing. Um, yeah. 
you know, and how do you, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about that with uh, Swifty and Amos from ABGB about how important water is, you know, for you, are there uh, guiding principles around that? And where do you, you know, how do you, um, uh, you, what does that water treatment process look like? How have you decided on which of the, you know, mineral contents to push and, uh, you know, made uh, specific decisions about, uh, you know, how to, uh, where to go in these kinds of ranges that are common? So uh, water is, this is the hardest part to, to learn about and describe, but also kind of the easiest to describe in a way, because what you're really trying to do when these, when these beer styles came up throughout the centuries, you know, they started brewing to get the best beer they could, which meant having to brew with the water they had. Uh, and that sort of involved sort of dictated what malts they would use uh, just to get the best yield from what they were doing, the best uh, fermentation, uh, loudering, all that stuff. So they, that's part of what makes the style the style is the water that came from it. So, I mean, that's why pale ales work uh, great out of uh, Britain, but not so great out of Germany. So with German beers, most of the time, uh, aside from the German pills is a, a good outlier. You know, the water needs to be soft. Um, so you always, you're always wanting to bring the pH down. Uh, and the best two ways to do that are with you know, either uh, calcium chloride and gypsum are the two most popular. So if, when trying to decide between the two of those, uh, we normally, we use a mix, um, but you have to be careful with the sulfates, the gypsum, um, because that sort of gives it more of a harsh flavor. That is really used well when you want to accentuate the hops and uh, get a bit more perceived bitterness out of the beer. Calcium chloride is awesome because it gives you a nice uh, soft water and it really accentuates the malt flavors and that's really what uh, a lot of German brews are going for. Uh, the German pills, which is you know uh, their take off the Bohemian pills, that's brewed with harder water um, and then so sulfates kind of are really good uh, there to sort of because hard water really brings out um, the hot characters there. Uh, and it has that nice sort of rough, dry finish that uh, a Pilsner is famous for. Um, but, you know, that's kind of the long and short of it. You just want to match what the water does to make that beer that beer and how it works with the malt. Um, so you're really, when you're getting down to it, looking for the proper pH in your mash. So uh, with most of these beers, you want anywhere from a 5.3 uh, to a 5.5 pH, and that'll you know, greatly help with clarity, that'll help with loudering, that'll help with uh, head retention, that'll just make your life easier and make the beer you know, just proper and give you the nice body that you want. Do you strip it out and build it back up? or? Um... Uh, so yes, we do use a reverse osmosis system. So water comes in nice and alkaline, uh, mixes with the malt. So it's... It's very easy for us. We know what we're going to get, but uh, you know, if this is something that's just bothering the hell out of you, just worry about getting that proper pH in your mash. That is the most important thing, and that's really what the overall goal is, and that's how these styles came up anyway. Um, but for rule of thumb, get the pH right. Calcium chloride is good for malt flavors, um, and then gypsum is good to bring out more of those hot flavors. Yeah. Um, do you use a common base malt across, uh, um, you know, your various lager styles or, uh, you know, do you vary that based on what the beer is? Uh, no, pretty much, uh, 95% of all our beers, the base malt is just regular German Pilsner. Um, so there are some, uh, difference like the IPA will do German pale, uh, the v we do a Vienna, uh, and that's base malt's Vienna. And then maybe a our dunkel is base malt, it's just Munich malt. But yeah, um, the Pilsner malt is basically just welcome in all styles uh, in German beer. And it's versatile. You can do whatever you need it to. Um, and you know, most people want to get creative and crazy and do lots of different uh, malts in their beer. But you know, it's, it's just not necessary. You, you can really get a lot out of just a few malts in your bill. And, and if you had to pick one uh, in the entire world for your beer, I'd pick Pilsner malt. How did you, uh, you know, obviously there's more than one Pilsner malt available out there in the market. How mm -hmm. did you all decide on a Pilsner malt, uh, you know, that was going to be the base of this brewery? So we just do Weirman Pils. Um, Weirman does make a, uh, a pale Pilsner 
which is really, really good for municalis to get as pale as you can get it. Uh, and then they do floor malted, which is obviously less modified. And, you know, in the interest of, you know, production, we're a production brewery, we have to do what makes the most sense, um, you know, labor wise and economically. But uh, the regular Pilsner malt from Wyoming is the right color for your uh, Pilsners and lagers, uh, municalises, excuse me. Um, and it mixes well with, you know, caramel, crystal malts, uh, all the other malts add color, roastiness. Um, it's just so versatile um, and it can really do whatever you want it to do. But the, but the one caveat is it has to be as pale as uh, you can get it for, for a municalis and it, it does do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and you, you certainly mentioned, uh, you know, mash steps and whatnot. Do you decoct in the brew house in order to build some extra character there? Um, I feel like I have to ask that question because Joe would ask you that if he, uh, if he was doing uh, this. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Joe did ask me about that when I saw him. So, um, we don't have a proper brew house for decocting. And I know I said earlier, you can't, edit your brew house you have to edit your yourself uh, that was kind of a blanket statement but because we edited our brew house a little bit uh so uh, we, we gave it the ability to mash in and then take 66 percent of our mash and transfer it into louder ton oil in the mash ton the remaining 33 percent and then send 66 back into the mash ton and we can decoct that way it does do some things with the, the malt I'm not super happy about, but it hasn't shown up in the final product. Like some malt's exposed for a little longer than I'd like. So we, do, we did that with a Pilsner. I did not want to do it. One of my brewers wanted to do it. Uh, so I said, sure, we have the time, let's do it. Um, the Pilsner is a taproom exclusive. So we're only doing one. Uh, you can't, uh, for most of our beers, we do four in a day and you got to go mash and go louder. And then once it's louder and you're ready to go into the mash again, you can't do that with decoction. And not to mention decoction takes like 14 hours to do one. <laughs> um, That's right. Just one batch. But so we did it with the Pilsner. And to be honest with you, because uh, I've seen you're curious as to whether or not it tasted different than the non decocted Pilsner. Sure. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, as much as I hate to say it, yeah, it tastes a little bit different. Huh. Um, just a little bit, it's almost a little bit deeper, but I don't know if it's because I'm so knowledgeable about the Pilsner that I don't know that a layman could taste it. Yeah. So I personally don't find that it's as necessary as it used to be, especially especially in Pilsners and Kolsch's and lighter, lighter stuff like that, because at that point, you're really starting to mess with the color and you don't want to do that. Um, but in some of these deeper beers, Meritzen's, uh, Box and stuff like that, if you want that, like, you know, deep, ready, Maillard reaction character, just, um, if, if you get the time and inclination, go ahead and do it. I, uh, you can make the best beer in the world and decoction isn't needed anymore. It's, I, I, we've, I've loved these Texas lager conversations for that same very reason, because you have live oak that's heavy on decoction and you've got ABGB who is dead set against decoction <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, and it goes to show, fantastic well, they beers, broke right? both, yeah. you know, right. And, and there you all are too. And so, you know, here you have these, you know, varying approaches that can all yield world-class beers, even if they take different pathways to get there. It's just always interesting to see, you know, what, from a sensory perspe you know, perspective, you know, what that looks like, you know, for you. And of course, again, every system and how they decoct and what the impact of that is can be a little bit different depending on, you know, the kind of system that you're, you're doing this on. And so it's not ever just a, you know, a one size. Well, I will all. say this and not to get, not to wax poetic too much. Um, I'm a big believer in uh, the work you put into a product shows to a customer so if you're decocting your beer and you're doing it well and you've studied how to do it um and you really understand why you're doing it and what you're doing it for that's going to show up in the final product but it's 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 anything if you research your beers like love the beers you're brewing know what you want to give the customer uh, i mean decoction is just one of those extra steps that show how much you put into that beer like, working hard towards something is always going to make it a better product and if you're working hard, if you're decocking. I, I love that idea, that correlation versus causation kind of idea that it may not be the decoction that makes the beer better, 
but if you're decocting, you certainly care about making the beer better. And that is probably being reflected in a whole lot of other choices that you're making as well. Yeah. Yeah. I 100% believe that. So. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the super fine points. Let's talk about Hellas, uh, you know, just in context, um, you know, tasting such a light and such a simple beer at its core, um, but making that a compelling beer, one that, um, you know, people as they drink it, enjoy it without it having to be the focus of how they drink it. Um, talk to me about that process of editing that you started to engage in. I mean, we, we did talk about some of the varying brew house, you know, factors, but from a sensory perspective, as you're tasting a Hellas, um, you know, what are some of those things that you were able to identify that you, you know, those, those individual factors that you wanted to tweak a little bit in order to make it hit it, the exact notes that, uh, that you all had as a goal? Uh, sure. So, you know, the, the initial run, like when I, my first day here, the first beer I tried was, was the, uh, lager and, uh, you know, there was a little bit of, you know, I hadn't tried the beer yet. The first beer had been brewed when I accepted the job. Sure. So I took a sip of it right out of the tank. So I'm just having this nice wickle beer, uh, Municalis. And, uh, you know, I tasted it and my first words were, oh, thank God. Like, because it tasted <laughs> really good. Um, yeah. And it was all there. Um, so, you know, in the final product, it came out, uh, I mentioned this earlier, just a, a little too on the sweet side, which... Uh, could be from a few factors. I mean, it, it, it could have had uh, too long of um, uh, a rest in the mash at too high a temperature, uh, and just has all this unfermentable sugar in it, uh, or it didn't ferment out enough, um, or it just didn't balance out the malt sweetness enough, uh, which turned out to be the latter. Uh, and you know, the head retention just wasn't there. Uh, I mean, it, it was there, but it, it wasn't good enough. Um, and you know, the aroma was good, but you could still sort of smell a little bit of that sweet corn in there. So, um, there's uh, a, few, a few more little things here and there, but you know, a lot of that could be cleaned up easy. So like with foam head retention, a quick fix is to just use, you know, uh, care foam, care pills, something like that. And there is, you know, nothing wrong in doing that if you have issues that you can't quite work out, but you know, the hops were a big one for me. I, like keeping the hops low, I understand was the goal, but the hops are there for a reason. And that's to balance out so you don't have, you know, that malt just totally dominating. So that, that, that needed to be done. And then there were just, you know, at certain parts, the, the mash was a little too runny, things like that. Uh, so you wanted to have a better grist ratio of water. Uh, and ours typically, you know, it's, we do about three and a half to one, uh, grist to liquor ratio, which is pretty thin, but you know, thin leads to nice drier beers, but it was even thinner than that. It just wasn't working out. And you know, the pH on the last runnings and louder was like a little too low. Like we were over sparking rather. And that was causing issues down the line, giving you like a little bitter taste in the beer, uh, you know, there was just a lot of little things like that. Um, it, it, you know, it just needed some care and, and clean up and basically just sit down with a pen and paper, go through, re go through all the formulas and uh, see what you can get that way. So basically just reverse engineering the beer and rewriting the recipe. And these are all, you know, on the verge of threshold, you know, things generally, you know, that, uh, and very small points, you know, they're not, obviously, if you're tasting the first batch off the tank, and it's pretty damn good, you know, um, we're talking about minute elements. 100%. And, so, know, and again, yeah. like, I don't want to uh, say that this beer wasn't sellable, because it was, and people liked it, right? Um, sure. But, you know, you see things that aren't sustainable or as you get bigger, they're going to get called out. Cause I mean, I was calling them out as if, you know, other brewers are going to see that and brewers won't tell you to your face what they think of it. They just <laughs> won't. They want to be like, yeah, man, this is great. Uh, so you really need to know what the beer needs to look like, taste like, smell, smell like, because uh, a brewer will straight lie to you because, you know, we're all friends. Like we're all good with each other. Um, but that's one of the reasons I'm so big into, you know, sending your beer to competitions. It's, it's a lot of money, but a judge will be honest with you. 
um, because they have a scorecard and they're not in front of your face. They, they will be honest with you. And they also have a context, you know, and I think that's the other piece, you know, I, I can go to a brewery and enjoy mo you know, well-made beer from, uh, you know, most brewers that are, you know, uh, have achieved a certain level of accomplishment and, and, you know, respect, but it's a whole different matter, you know, because, you know, that, that might be the one Hellas that I'm drinking in one place at one time. And I like drinking beer. And especially if it's the first few beers of the day, like, oh, there's just nothing more delicious than that. Um, but all of that context changes when you are looking at it through the scope of 20 or 30 or 40 different beers of the same style next to each other, um, you know, where you're diving into the minutia of those kinds of things. And mm -hmm. so that kind of judging perspective um, is very different and will certainly what appears in that context, you know, shoulder to shoulder, beer to beer versus enjoying a beer, sitting at a place, enjoying the experience of being there. I mean, they're, they're very different modes of considering something. Now, you know, all of those beers, most of those Hellas, I imagine, that are submitted to the Great American Beer Festival for medals are going to be pretty good. Some are going to be great. You know, some are, may not be as good, but um, most of them are probably going to be enjoyable to drink, um, you know, as long as the brewer's making them reasonably well. Uh, you know, but what it elevates to something to great, you know, or world class or best in best in breed, like, you know, that's that's a whole nother matter. All yeah, time. and then that's that's my job. So that's that's all ownership told me to do. Uh, yeah, make the best. Like, huh? Just 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 make it the best. And, you know, frankly, I have no excuse not to. So, um, yeah, you know, so stuff like that has to be covered. And honestly, if you're taking care of your beer like that, uh, you know, you're taking care of your brewery. Like, I mean, it's the old thing. I think I might have the band wrong, but Van Halen used to be famous for not wanting green M&Ms in their bowl. So you'd have to pluck out all the green M&Ms. And they didn't do that because they were weird. They did that because if you couldn't get all the green M&Ms out, how are you supposed to set their stage up? You know, like the details are important. Uh, so that that's even in brewing, you cannot uh, let any details uh, go, especially if you're doing uh, clean beers like Kolsch's and Lagers. Um, so yeah, and a judge won't lie to you, find people who won't lie to you. I have a right. few uh, and a few people in my life who will not lie to me who know beer really well. Uh, and just don't take it personal. Either agree with them, disagree with them, or you know. Sure, sure. Um, but they got out. You always got to reflect on on your product. Right. Let's talk about the yeast challenges. You uh, alluded to them earlier, where you had some. You were initially bringing yeast in through customs from German uh, yeast propagator, um, and then you had to kind of make some mid stride shifts around that in order to. Um, you know, improve the, the process around that. Uh, talk to me a little bit about solving that problem. Sure. So, and, and you know, it's not even just that it's coming from Germany. It's that it, it is so hard and so unreliable to, because um, when you got a brew, you got a brew. And if you don't have yeast to propagate, uh, you're kind of dead in the water. Um, and you can only reuse yeast so many times um, from previous brews. So, you know, it, the yeast would get held up in customs. It, you know, we'd order slants, you know, come back with half the cells dead. And it, you could still prop that up to make good yeast, but it's not as much as you wanted. Um, and again, it's so unpredictable when it's going to get in, um, which was okay when we first started because we're brewing far, far less. Our first year, we brewed less than 2,000 barrels. So, you know, we could wait around a little bit. So, as long as you got it in on time and you took care of it, uh, it, it produced a great beer, but it was, again, just something that's not consistent and inconsistency is just not acceptable. Um, so, you know, I'd been familiar with, with Y yeast, I used them for years, um, very familiar with their strains. I know what they're going to do, how they're going to behave. So basically I decided I wanted to just pull from within the country. Uh, so we chose them, um, and basically that then we just had to choose which strain worked best for our brew house, uh, which strain worked well for you know the Kolsch, and then um, and then the lager. Uh, so with a brewery like this, you can only have so many strains uh, if you're going to repropagate them and use them. So we only have four propagators and then three in-house strains. Um, so for the lager, we went with 2124, which is a Bohemian strain. And 
works really well with the low temperatures that we want to ferment our lagers at. Uh, we ferment at 10 degrees Celsius. That's actually a degree Celsius on the high end that, that most breweries do it, uh, but it works really well with that strain, really clean, you don't taste the yeast. Um, and it ferments at about a, a good clip. It, uh, you know, takes, it has a nice 24 hour lag period, uh, takes about 10 to 14 days to finish out. Uh, really good about uh, diacetyl. Um, the one bummer is, is it, it's not really good with beer clarity. So you have to be able to filter your beer properly uh, if you're going to use it. Um, and then we and use- And you're fermenting most, the production beers are all fermented in uh, cylinder conicals. You do have some very small taproom size. Yeah, so- Horizontal fermenters. So this is actually kind of a drawback of, of the brewery. So all of our fermenters are uh, cylindrical. Uh, you know, optimally you want to go from uh, a CCT to a lagering tank, which is horizontal, uh, not vertical, uh, for the lagering process. We can't do that, so we lager in the conicals, um, which as long as you take care of it, uh, you burp the yeast, let all the dead yeast cells out at the bottom, it is um, totally fine to do with your beer. Uh, so you're lagering in the same that. tank, though, and not, not transferring not to the tank? Not transferring at all. Interesting, yep. okay. Yeah, yeah, so um, that's super untraditional, but that's us using what we have. So we're, when you're using all your tanks, that's kind of all you can do. Um, but it works out. Uh, but, but yeah, you've got to take care of it. Uh, and you've got to watch it and, you know, make sure that all those dead yeasties aren't getting into your product. But, sure. Um, but yeah, it finishes out just fine. Uh, and it's a good consistent beer. So, so we're happy with it. Um, and then for the, the Kolsch and the uh, Amber and the Amber being an alt beer, we just use a regular German ale strain. Uh, it's 1007 from Y yeast. So it's not an actually specific Kolsch strain, but it has all the behaviors we like uh, and it works well uh, with the fermentation. Um, and it gives us the proper fruit. It's that nice, like slight fruity tanginess that you expect in a Kolsch. Um, and it also blends really well with the malt and the amber. Uh, so it's just a good versatile strain and it handles all the temperatures well. And if we have to do an ale that's not a ale that you lager, that strain also works well at higher temperatures for those styles. So it's a really good trade-off if we need to do another style. We have the yeast in-house that is capable of doing it. So that's just one of the decisions you have to make when choosing these strains. Like how is it going to behave for, for other styles when you're so limited like that? And then we just have the, the I apologize, uh, then we just have the uh, 3068. No, the IPA uses, that's what I'm talking about. So the IPA uses the uh, German ale yeast. Oh, okay. Uh, the only, so the only other strain we have is the Weinstefan wheat, uh, which is a 3068, uh, which is obviously very popular and that works really well for our head bison. Um, how often do you, uh, you know, go back to props versus, um, you know, repitching, uh, you know, in your brew house? We will uh, go about five generations in a pinch, I'll go six. I don't really want to go more than that. Most people will go ten, uh, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. I don't I don't want to do that, um, just because you know the makeup of the yeast is going to change. Uh, I would I would never recommend going past twelve, but if you're going past ten, uh, you're you're you should probably change how you're doing it. So I would say five, and then you really want to pitch that yeast not long after it's been crashed. Is that sensory driven? I mean, where, or, you know, I mean, I imagine there's a, you know, a reason for that kind of decision making on your side and not just, uh, you know, superstition. Yeah. So basically in that closed environment with all that CO2, you know, the yeast don't really care for CO2 that much, but they have right. to adapt to live in that environment. So if the yeast are adapting to live in that environment or they're essentially evolving and they're, you know, their makeup's changing. If a yeast makeup changes, the way they're going to eat those sugars uh, is going to change as well. So you're going to get, you know, slight flavor differences once you get past 10 generations. Uh, and again, uh, the, you know, somebody off the street might not be able to taste it, but the brewer should. The brewer is um, keeping up with their beer and tasting it all the time. Um, conversely, if you're open fermenting, which we do with our Hefeweizen, uh, the that doesn't happen. Like the yeast are free uh, and have this nice open environment. Uh, the CO2 isn't 
intrusive at all. It just leaves the vessel. Um, and you could repitch that yeast for thousands of generations and you really wouldn't get many, uh, many differences at all. That's pretty much what it is. It, slight aroma uh, profiles. Um, it's not that they're bad, they're just different and they're not, not what you want. So it, sure. it, it just changes from style to style, but I, you should be safe within five generations, even within 10, but yeah. you're, you're yeah. flirting if you go past that. Let's talk a little bit about finishing. And so, you know, on carbonation side, uh, you know, how um, do you spin tanks or, uh, you know, do you uh, uh, force carbonate? And then let's also talk a little bit about filtration and how you, you know, finish off these beers. So we do uh, spoon the tanks. Um, but so earlier when I touched on how we're guided by the Reinhardt but uh, this is one of the areas where uh, we're not compliant with it. So, um, you know, and another one way back to the mashing process, you can't add salts to the mash. That's verboten. Can't do it. We do it anyway because America is the land of the free, I suppose. You, we spooned, but in, it's really, that is, that is an art because if you close the tank in too early, you haven't let out you know, all those sulfurous compounds where you want. And that's cool in Germany. Like you can get a really sulfurous uh, Pilsner or Hellas in Germany. Uh, but uh, you don't and really want that. people will dig America. it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, but the Americans don't want that. So you want to let that out. But if you do it too late, you're not going to have the carbonation. So it's a real balancing act. Um, we, we tend to err on the side of doing it a little too early because when it goes into the bright, we will force carb just, again, in the name of consistency. And when you force carb, uh, you're getting a lot of those sulfurous compounds out. So that's a really huge benefit to that uh, on top of the consistency. But, you know, my main goal is if you crack open uh, a lager today and one six months from now from a different batch, you know, it, it's got to taste the same carbonation wise. So, yeah, horse carbines. OK, my book. I like it. Customers yeah. like it. Uh, how about filtration? Uh, you mentioned that earlier as being necessary to you know, help polish up the beers at the end. So filtration is very, very important um, to get the beer clarity right. So if now some very talented brewers can get nice clear beer right out of the aging tank. Um, so we don't have, like I mentioned earlier, it's different brewery by brewery. So you really got to understand your brewery. We don't have lagering tanks. If we had lagering tanks, I could get you just almost near perfect clear beer from this. Um, and again, like the, the lager yeast we use, that doesn't help clarity that much. It's it likes to remain in suspension a little bit more. Um, so, you know, in that case, you have to be able to filter that out. Um, You're starting so with our, two strikes against you there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we um, use a centrifuge to filter most of that out. And it, it's just a centrifuge. We don't use uh, any a D filter um, or anything like that. It's just a centrifuge. And then the centrifuge goes through a polishing filter, which is about seven microns, uh, seven micron opening. So it's getting all the big proteins and the hot particles that might have bypassed the centrifuge, but it's not taking out any of the flavor. So uh, people hear filtering and they think that, you know, you're stripping some of that flavor out, but uh, that's, that's just not the case. Um, and, you know, filtering for the most part is very necessary because that beer needs to be brilliant, brilliant. Aside from, you know, uh, one-off examples like the Hefeweizen, which we just directly transfer into the bright past uh, any filtration. Um, so yeah, that's very important. Um, and again, if you don't have a filter or a method to filter in your brewery, uh, or at home, you need to lager, lager the beer properly, uh, in the secondary fermentation and you should be okay. It's so funny because I had another brewer uh, uh, email me last week. He's like, I was just listening to this latest episode of the podcast, and they were talking about filtration. And now I'm thinking about how I can fit, fit a filter <laughs> into my brew house. Now, um, you know, and I think that you know, while, yes, it might have negative connotations, you know, in some kinds of regards, um, the visual of, you know, German style and Czech style lagers is super important, you know, yes. like, um, you know, from that nice thick head with tight bubbles, you know, and that kind of glassy sheen to it, you know, to the kind of brilliant color 
Um, you know, we certainly everybody heard Dusan talking about how you know they've gone they you know focused on pre pro pills or their pre war pills because using that corn component just lets them make the beer that much brighter. Um, but that visual, I mean, you know, is, is such an important piece of this equation and such a compelling reason to also you know keep drinking these beers in addition to the flavor. Um, it's something that brewers have to and should be paying attention to with this. And I, and I will say too, if uh, your only method of filtration is, you know, something that's low, like swing one to three microns, um, your DE filter uh, or uh, plate frame filters, whatever you're using, if that's taking away any of your uh, BUs or any of your flavor, that's just another one of those things you have to account for uh, when you're writing your recipe. So if you're losing five BUs um, through your filter, just, you know, add extra hops. Uh, you know, uh, you just, that's just stuff you have to account for in the brewing process. So having to use a filter should not change the final beer that you want. Right, right. Well, we, uh, we really didn't get to talk about German IPA, even though I think it's fun that you take a, an IPA approach using German ingredients and using, uh, you know, German yeast in order to kind of make something that still feels like, you know, a, a beer that, uh, an IPA that would come from a German focused brewery. Um, you know, but, you know, before we, uh, close, I'm, I'm just curious, like, what is the long term for Altstadt and, uh, you know, what is next on your horizon? You know, you've come in, you've certainly, you know, helped to try to, tweak these beers in the direction that you want to um that you go and and clearly the feedback has been positive for what you've been doing um you know what's what's next for you and what's next for the brewery well um you know we just want to grow a little bit more like uh, grow into ourselves a little bit so we're going to do about projecting about 12,000 barrels this year i'd like just with this facility we have now uh, i think we could do well over 22 thousand barrels a year so honestly i'd like to hit that and then have to worry about how we're going to do more um and you know really what we're doing is making a beer that's just approachable for everybody to drink you know you get tired of drinking triple hop or you know quads or pastry stouts all of which i love so uh, but but go back step back a little bit to you know, where this all started from, because, you know, the Reinheimske boot started what beer is today, and then it evolved from that. So it's great to step back from in the craft beer world and still have breweries like uh, Altstadt or ABGB uh, or Live Oak um, and the several other examples we have around here and throughout the country. Um, and then it's also good for people who drink, you know, from the bigger breweries to have an on ramp into craft beer. If I give them one of our loggers, you know, they're not going to spit it out because it's a really good on ramp. And, you know, when you start to understand what beer can be, it doesn't have to be so cold to enjoy it. Um, like beer has great flavors. Um, you know, that it's, I, those are the people I want to bring in uh, to, to our world. Um, so hopefully we do more of that. And then, you know, we have to hit, you know, my goal of 20,000 barrels a year. And then, you know, grow a little bit more because we can't even fill that. So that's kind of where we're at right now. But you know, Texas, I love it yeah. we're, we're doing we're doing great stuff. So I, I'm happy here. That's fantastic. Texas is a huge market of beer drinkers and craft is only a small portion of that at this point. Um, it's There's still a, a lot of wide open space for craft brewers to um, make compelling beers that reach Texas drinkers and that, um, you know, to that find them where they are and, and turn them into craft consumers that can appreciate flavor as well as, uh, you know, the fine craftsmanship that come out of that. So, uh, you know, I think it's a fantastic thing to see more Texas breweries, you know, and, and this, especially this kind of, uh, uh, group of log making breweries in, in Texas, um, you know, growing and meeting that market and, uh, you know, finding those kinds of drinkers for the beer and not, you know, simply trying to, um, you know, uh, or I should say complementing those other breweries that are trying to find the hipper, you know, hyper element of the market. Um, and I love that this kind of breadth of brewing uh, in the craft world exists like that. Uh, it's what we should be doing in this world of craft beer. And so um, if, you, if people get a chance to go to Allstadt, uh, don't pass it up. Like it is literally 
uh, an uh, amazing experience to just see that this place exists at all. Um, it is, uh, it's such a cool thing. And I'm and drinking the beer there, uh, you know, as it is with most breweries is, um, a special experience that everybody, you know, it's always better to drink a beer at the place where it's made. And so, uh, if you're in Fredericksburg, Texas, um, you know, on that wine trail through, uh, central Texas and Fredericksburg, it is a must hit spot. Um, and you're only distributed in Texas right now, right? That's right. Only in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, GND Chillers is the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling. Try sativa in your hop forward beers. Old Orchard Concentrates offer real fruit first. Explore new marketing opportunities at marketmybrewery.com and check the ABS commercial Facebook page to find out how to enter to win a keg Viking. Of course, if you'd like to support this very podcast, go to beerandbrewing.com. Click on that subscribe button. And if you're a pro brewer, consider our new all access pro subscriptions that combine best of the magazine exclusive online content video and more um craig if people want to learn more about all shot where do they find you guys uh, in real life and on the internet um well in real life in fredericksburg texas big german castle right on highway 290 um and uh basically you know any chain uh in texas uh heb heb is a, a a great great store that i'm very sorry a lot of you guys don't have because it's awesome but uh yeah bars all that You're stuff in the grocery stores bars yeah, yeah grocery stores bars all that stuff um and then online just at allstopbeer.com uh on facebook and instagram all that good stuff cool well it's been fun to talk to you about loggers uh congratulations on those two gold medals in 2019 and uh I, uh for those of you again who are all access subscribers to craft beer and brewing magazine uh, look forward to a class video class with uh, craig coming up which we shot right before the entire state uh seemed to shut down due to ice storm uh, what a crazy thing in fact that's why we didn't do this podcast live and in person which we were planning to do but uh it was a friday afternoon and well, you guys got hit with ice and frozen conditions. In fact, it froze the gates of the brewery open. Yeah, you had, uh, to, you had to get to warmer weather in Colorado. Just... And I tried to get out of Dodge and yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, beat the snow back to Colorado because I, I drove out of concern <laughs> for travel and everything. Glad to hear that the brewery did okay through that. Oh, glad to hear the rest of. Uh, of Texas is recovering from that and that, uh, you know, hopefully things are, are moving in the right direction and, uh, you guys stay warm, with clean water and heat and all of that fun stuff. Yeah. Well, we made it. You made it. Maybe, yeah. maybe we learned some lessons along the way. Hopefully. We'll see. Hopefully though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Anyway, thanks for joining me, Craig. It was great to talk with you. Absolutely, Cheers. Jamie. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.